Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. I've brought another one back from Japan with the help of my friend who lives over there. This is a Tak Matsumoto Signature Les Paul. So Tak is essentially R slash, but in Japan, to put it into layman's terms here. Without learning all of his history, all of his songs and all that, just know he is an ultra popular guy over there. And he has had so many signature guitars with Gibson. That's why I say he's kind of like Slash. So let's take a little bit of time today to learn about Takahiro here. Starting with this one, known as Tack Burst, and what I would say is one of my favorite signatures of his. So hopefully it made it okay from Japan, because I'm all pumped up to talk about this one today. Inside here sleeps the Gibson USA version of Tack Burst. So the best thing to know about this one is it's birthed in that second golden era of Les Paul standards. I've documented these pretty extensively now at this point. It's the early to mid 2000s before they started to do the weight relief back when they had really select choice mahogany backs like this one has a little bit of flame figuring. Nothing quite as much as my actual flame back and quilty back examples or like that P90 Yamano one that I did. But this one came about in that time. But it's got quite a few unique features to it that makes it different from everything else. So let's learn a little bit about Tack now that we've seen what we're gonna talk about today. Mr. Matsumoto is a Japanese musician, a songwriter, as well as a record producer, but he's best known for being the main guitarist of the group Bees. B apostrophe Z. They are one of the best selling music acts in Japan, and they're just kind of like a duo. But on top of being the guitarist, he's one of the main songwriters as well, and he has tons of successful solo work. So when I say the Slash of Japan, people worship him just like people worship Slash. If you're not familiar with their work, I would definitely suggest checking out the songs Dinosaur and Still alive before you listen to all his other stuff because it's some pretty nice hard rock music but he was the first Japanese artist to get a signature guitar from Gibson in 1999 according to Gibson's own website and he still gets them yet today now he generally has three different shapes there's the traditional Les Paul there's a double cutaway shape which is probably the reason why we had the modern DC try to be introduced to the USA and we saw things like the epi DC pros get released the double cuts are quite interesting they're not exactly like a regular Les Paul double cut they're they're a little bit more offset, but they generally have very beautiful tops. And he also gets Firebirds. Now his Firebirds are a little bit special. I know of at least two runs. There's a trans black and then more of a burst one, but they have less Paul headstocks to them. So I've got to try one of those at one point in time. And they all come in all various colors. There's been many different runs as I was telling you earlier. There's USA, Custom Shop, you've got Epiphones. He's got finishes from brown to blue. But the four most common traits that all of his signatures have are there's no pick guards on them. They have black binding they have abalone inlays on the fretboard, and they have uncovered zebra bobbin pickups. Generally, he seems to prefer quilt tops on his signatures, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been a few flame tops as well. And sometimes he even just goes for some exotic colors, like his very first one in 1999 was a Gibson USA in canary yellow, which was later turned into a custom shop one just a couple of years ago. So tack burst here, we can see all those things that we were just talking about. Black binding, not only on the body, but also on the neck. Abalone inlay instead of mother of pearl or acrylic trapezoids like you would normally find on a Gibson USA. And this bad boy's got a pretty nice quilt top to it. And hey, would you look at that? I didn't know that that made it different from a regular USA one. This has a true ABR1 bridge outside of the custom shop. That's actually kind of cool. At this point in time, I forget when the classics got transformed out of that. I'm not sure if that was from that era or not, but it does make the standard interesting. Most of his Les Paul signatures will have his name right here up along the fretboard, Tak Matsumoto. Then the back has a nice dark color to it. Like it's a little bit of a darker cherry red than the other ones I've had. But if I understand the lore correctly, the Tack Burst was his second main signature guitar. This one started around 2003. And over the course of the years, it was offered in three different brands. So you have the Epiphone Elitist. So if you don't know what an Elitist is, I mean, that's a whole nother topic, but it is the highest end Epiphones you can get. Those things are supposed to slay like Les Paul Studios. People question, do I get the low end Gibson or do I get the high end Epiphone Elitist? And a lot of times people will choose the Elitist up until like a Les Paul standard or sometimes even over it. I've heard really good things about those, but those are like $2,000 used. And then you've got the Gibson USA, like we're looking at here today that cost about two times as much as the Epiphone 
elitists. And then if you want to pay two and a half to three times more than this bad boy, you can indeed find a custom shop version of this same guitar. So let's focus on this one for today. It was a limited edition of 300. Now, to be honest, this one's a little bit more worn than I was expecting. But when you buy from Japan, it's hard to get like detailed information on these things. So sometimes it's just a risk in order to document a cool guitar. Now, unfortunately, this is not an original case. It's actually a 90s Gibson case. I believe they originally shipped in like the black Gibson USAs. It might have actually had a signature decal on it. And they would have originally had a big paper COA. It's very common for people to lose that. But for a Gibson USA to have a COA back in this era was kind of a big deal. So to learn more about this particular one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take a look at its individual parts and specs before we just absolutely fall in love with this thing. Man, that top. <laughs> let's get to that workbench. Man, this guitar is just more bad news after more bad news. I don't think we have the original pickups. There's been a tuner replaced, but there was one happy surprise underneath here. So according to spec sheets online, these are supposed to have like some special tax signature pickups that they made just for him. Now it's either online is wrong and this is what it actually has or somebody's played with our pickups. Judging by the solder joints, I believe somebody's played with our pickups. So we have burst bucker number two and number three. That's very similar to what a regular standard of this era would come with. Unfortunately, I could not find actual photos of what the backside of the original pickups look like, so it's just kind of in the air at this point. These pickups read 7.97k ohms in our bridge position, our neck a little less hot at 7.46, and our middle position just for fun, 3.85. However, inside our neck pickup cavity, it reads T-A-K for Tak Matsumoto. And the bridge LPTQ, maybe Les Paul Tak quilt top, not sure. But you can see the maple top right there joining onto the mahogany body. And unless it's a signature spec, this is within the era where Les Paul standards had nine hole weight relief. As far as the bridge tailpiece situation goes, we had briefly talked upon that on the unboxing. This is a straight up ABR1 bridge drilled directly into the top. There is no stud within the body, just a post. And this is a real Gibson ABR1 bridge, nicely aged. To match that, we have a full weight tailpiece. That looks like so. I am pretty happy with the top that I found on this. It's very active, a nice and wide quilt. You can see Tack's name right there a little bit more clearly. And all things considered, I mean, as much as this one was played, it's in pretty remarkable condition. Got a few like nicks and dings on the top, but nothing too crazy. I would say the worst of it's really like over here, you can see like a few dings. And if you catch it in the light just right, you can see some light finish checking. Definitely the worst area right here where somebody was picking and some dings like right here. But no pick guard, that's a tack thing. Something else I noticed about these knobs is this one, it just moves. Like it's not a push pull pot or anything. It's just, it doesn't secure to the shaft very well. I tried widening it just a tad, but it didn't do anything. It stays on. It's actually pretty hard to remove. That's just something I noticed that these bottom tone pots have going on with them. But those are a nice dark amber color that match our finish here. So moving on from our maple top and mahogany body, we move on to the mahogany neck with the rosewood fretboard. Besides the black binding and the abalone inlay, nothing too special here. I mean, this is an extra dark fretboard, if that's what you're going for, but still has those nice rosy streaks. But it's still the regular 12 inch radius with the 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length, as you can see here, and 22 medium jumbo frets. Due to the black binding though, you get white dot inlays on the side of the neck. This one definitely has some fret wear in like the cowboy cord areas, but after I polish these frets up, you can't really see it too much. I don't think you're going to need to level and recrown for quite some time. However, this is definitely not a case queen. Let's go ahead and grab the neck dimensions. Looks like we get 1.66 inches at the nut width. That increases to 2.04 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.83 and 0.93 by the 12th. I'd say it's definitely closer to a 60s neck profile, but we can definitely check that out on the contour gauge. Here's that neck profile at the 1st and 12th fret. Definitely C-shaped. Okay, so our headstock here. Gibson Mother of Pearl logo, gold Les Paul model silkscreen. It's got a lot of nicks, dings, scratches, and whatnot over here. But our truss rod's in good shape. The threads are just barely sticking past there, so that's got a lot of life left to it. But this is not the original truss rod cover. But when I took it off, I was surprised by this. We actually have tax signature here. 
Now, I have no way of knowing if that's actually real, but I mean, it looks pretty legit to me. And I'm not quite sure what that is, but it's also on tax signature crybaby, so maybe it's his name in kanji or something, I don't know. But at least we get one bonus here if they're going to steal our signature case. And then this tuner's been replaced, but it's really not that big of a deal. I'll show you on the back how I even figured it out. When I was cleaning the tuners, I was just wiping them off, and then I noticed, hey, that one has a lot more lubricant in it. And then I noticed, oh, there's no Gibson Deluxe branding on that one. So it's the same style, it's just not Gibson branded. But you can see that's chrome and these are nickel. So it's one of those things, once you notice it, you don't unnotice it. But at least it has the same number of rings, so you can't really tell from the front. But our serial number on this one dates it to 2,386 day of the year, 322nd in production for that particular day, not of this run, because there are only 300 made in USA. Now the neck does have some light nicks and dings and blemishes, but it cleaned up pretty okay. What I'm actually noticing here is that the neck has a slightly lighter color, probably because the lacquer's been a little bit worn. I would say that ding right there is the worst of the condition. Up here on the headstock, it looks like it hit a symbol or something. Pretty good sized ding. And the back's pretty chewed up back here. It's got some worming marks back here. Quite a few scratches, nicks and dings. That's quite a large impression, Ding. And you got that all here by your strap button stuff, too. Here's a pretty large chip in the finish that goes down to the wood. And another large Ding right here, but now let's look at our control cavity. So this, you know, it looks okay. But then when you look over here, you can definitely tell, yeah, pickups have at least been in and out. So they just did a better job on that one than they did over here, so... Likely not the original set, which really bums me out. I can live with non-original case and stuff, but for documentation's sake, I would rather it be original. But hey, we already started this video, we might as well finish it. Here's what our toggle switch cavity looks like as well. One of the cooler features here is the thin binding in the cutaway. It contrasts so much with that black binding, it's kind of cool. I noticed a large scratch impression right there. And you've got some of that in these other areas. And some more wear down here as well as along here on the edges. Now somewhere when I was first looking at this guitar, there was some like finish checking. I, I can't quite see that though now. But I think it was like on the edge or something, but sometimes the lighting plays with stuff like that. So I wouldn't say it was abused. I mean, it was just well used and taken care of, but not overly babied. All said and done, it weighs just a little over nine pounds, nine pounds, 1.2 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how it sounds. the clean tones go that neck pickup is extra glassy on this almost has a little bit of a semi hollowness to it sounds kind of thin but I think that'll sound pretty good with some distortion <laughs>
Now that we know all about the signature Tak Matsumoto Tak Burst Les Paul standard from Gibson USA, what are my final thoughts on this one? I thought the pickups that are in this particular one sound pretty good. They match his tone fairly well. But the one thing that I always think about when I see Tack signature guitars is they always remind me of a PRS for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's the black binding or the super fancy abalone inlays or the obnoxiously beautiful quilt tops that a lot of these have. It just kind of feels like you're playing a PRS. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at his double cuts, yeah, it kind of makes sense when you're seeing that, but then you transfer all that over here. I guess maybe it's because a lot of the PRS guitars do have uncovered pickups like these. At the end of the day, would I suggest paying a huge premium for one of these unless you're a big TAC fan? Probably not. I mean, for us American viewers that don't know too much about him, this is just a regular Les Paul standard, but done up with black binding and has a really nice top. But at the same time, if you're a guy who likes really fancy guitars, you don't necessarily care about the signature artist, this might be a guitar you want to check out because it's kind of got some interesting quirky specs. It's from that second golden era of Les Paul standard so you know you're going to have very fancy woods. I mean, this one's dancing all over the place as well as the quilt top moving. And it's not so crazy that it's too far out there. The only thing I think that might step it over the edge for some people is the fact that his name is right here on the guitar. But let me tell you, you don't really notice that while you're playing it. It's just such a beautiful piece. So I'm glad I was able to document Tack Burst. Maybe not all original like I was initially hoping for, but who knows? Maybe I'll get the uh, custom shop iteration one day. All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, you can check this one out on my website if you're interested in being the next owner of it. And we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.